This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To learn more or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Liberty by John Stuart Mill Chapter 5 Applications The principles asserted in these pages must be more generally admitted as the basis for discussion of details, before a consistent application of them to all the various departments of government and morales can be attempted with any prospect of advantage. The few observations I propose to make on questions of detail are designed to illustrate the principles rather than to follow them out to their consequences. I offer not so much applications as specimens of application, which may serve to bring into greater clearness the meanings and limits of the two maxims which together form the entire doctrine of this essay, and to assist the judgment in holding the balance between them in the cases where it appears doubtful which of them is applicable to the case. The maxims are, first, that the individual is not accountable to society for his actions, insofar as these concern the interest of no person but himself. Advice, instruction, persuasion, and avoidance by other people, if thought necessary by them for their own good, are the only measures by which society can justifiably express its dislike or disapprobation of his conduct. Secondly, that for such actions as are prejudicial to the interests of others, the individual is accountable and may be subjected either to social or to legal punishment if society is of opinion that the one or the other is requisite for its protection. In the first place, it must by no means be supposed, because damage or probability of damage to the interests of others can alone justify the interference of society, that therefore it always does justify such interference. In many cases, an individual, in pursuing a legitimate object, necessarily and therefore legitimately causes pain or loss to others, or intercepts a good which they had reasonable hope of obtaining. Such oppositions of interest between individuals often arise from bad social institutions, but are unavoidable while those institutions last, and some would be unavoidable under any institutions. Whoever succeeds in an overcrowded profession, or in a competitive examination, whoever is preferred to another in any contest for an object which both desires, reaps benefit from the loss of others from their wasted exertion and their disappointment. But it is, by common admission, better for the general interest of mankind that persons should pursue their objects undeterred by this sort of consequences. In other words, society admits no right, either legal or moral, in the disappointed competitors to immunity from this kind of suffering and feels called on to interfere only when the means of success have been employed, which it is contrary to the general interest to permit, namely, fraud or treachery and force. Again, trade is a social act. Whoever undertakes to sell any description of goods to the public does what affects the interest of other persons and of society in general. And thus his concept, in principle, comes within the jurisdiction of society. Accordingly, it was once held to be the duty of governments, in all cases which were considered of importance, to fix prices and regulate the processes of manufacture. But it is now recognized, though not till after a long struggle, that both the cheapness and the good quality of commodities are most effectually provided for by leaving the producers and sellers perfectly free under the sole check of equal freedom to the buyers for supplying themselves elsewhere. This is the so-called doctrine of free trade, 
which rests on grounds different from, though equally solid with, the principle of individual liberty asserted in this essay. Restrictions on trade, or on production for the purposes of trade, are indeed restraints, and all restraint, qua restraint, is an evil. But the restraints in question affect only that part of conduct which society is competent to restrain, and are wrong solely because they do not really produce the results which it is desired to produce by them. As the principle of individual liberty is not involved in the doctrine of free trade, so neither is it in most of the questions which arise respecting the limits of that doctrine, as, for example, what amount of public control is admissible for the prevention of fraud by adulteration, how far sanitary precautions or arrangements to protect work people employed in dangerous occupations should be enforced on employers. Such questions involve considerations of liberty only in so far as leaving people to themselves is always better, caterus parabolus, than controlling them. But that they may be legitimately controlled for these ends is in principle undeniable. On the other hand, there are questions relating to interference with trade, which are essentially questions of liberty, such as the main law already touched upon. The prohibition of the importation of opium into China, the restriction of the sale of poisons, all cases, in short, where the object of the interference is to make it impossible or difficult to obtain a particular commodity. These interferences are objectionable, not as infringements on the liberty of the producer or seller, but on that of the buyer. One of these examples, that of the sale of poisons, opens a new question, the proper limits of what may be called the functions of police, how far liberty may legitimately be invaded for the prevention of crime or of accident. It is one of the undisputed functions of government to take precautions against crime before it has committed, as well as to detract and punish it afterwards. The preventative function of government, however, is far more liable to be abused, to the prejudice of liberty, than the punitory function. For there is hardly any part of the legitimate freedom of action of a human being which would not admit of being represented, and fairly too, as increasing the facilities for some form or other of delinquency. Nevertheless, if a public authority, or even a private person, sees anyone evidently preparing to commit a crime, they are not bound to look on and act until the crime is committed, but may interfere to prevent it. If poisons were never bought or used for any purpose except the commission of murder, it would be right to prohibit their manufacture and sale. They may, however, be wanted not only for innocent but for useful purposes, and restrictions cannot be imposed in the one case without operating in the other. Again, it is the proper office of public authority to guard against accidents. If either a public officer or anyone else saw a person attempting to cross a bridge which had been ascertained to be unsafe, and there were no time to warn him of the danger, they might seize him and turn him back without any real infringement of his liberty. For liberty consists in doing what one desires, and he does not desire to fall into the river. Nevertheless, when there is not a certainty, but only a danger of mischief, no one but the person himself can judge of the sufficiency of the motive which may prompt him to incur the risk. In this case, therefore, unless he is a child, or delirious, or in some save excitement or absorption incompatible with the full use of the reflecting faculty, he ought, I conceive, to be only warned of the danger, not forcibly prevented from exposing himself to it. Similar considerations, applied to such a question as the sale of poisons, may enable us to decide which among the possible modes of regulation are or are not contrary to principle. Such a precaution, for example, 
as that of labeling the drug with some word expressive of its dangerous characters, may be enforced without violation of liberty. The buyer cannot wish not to know that the thing he possesses has poisonous qualities. But to require in all cases the certificate of a medical practitioner would make it sometimes impossible, always expensive, to obtain the article for legitimate uses. The only mode apparent to me in which difficulties may be thrown in the way of crime committed through this means, without any infringement worth taking into account upon the liberty of those who desire the poisonous substance for other purposes, consists in providing what, in the apt language of Bentham, is called, quote, pre-appointed evidence, unquote. This provision is familiar to everyone in the case of contracts. It is usual and right that the law, when a contract is entered into, should require, as the condition of its enforcing performance, that certain formalities should be observed, such as signatures, attestation of witnesses, and the like, in order that, in case of subsequent dispute, there may be evidence to prove that the contract was really entered into, and that there was nothing in the circumstances to render it legally invalid, the effect being to throw great obstacles in the way of fictitious contracts, or contracts made in circumstances which, if known, would destroy their validity. Precautions of a similar nature might be enforced in the sale of articles adapted to be instruments of crime. The seller, for example, might be required to enter in a register the exact time of the transaction, the name and address of the buyer, precise quality and quantity sold, to ask the purpose for which it was wanted, and to record the answer that he received. When there was no medical prescription, the presence of some third person might be required to bring home the fact to the purchaser in case there should afterwards be reason to believe that the article had been applied to criminal purposes. Such regulations would in general be no material impediment to obtaining the article, but a very considerable one to making an improper use of it without detection. The right inherent in society to ward off crimes against itself by antecedent precautions suggests the obvious limitation to the maxim that purely self-regarding misconduct cannot be properly meddled with in the way of prevention or punishment. Drunkenness, for example, in ordinary cases, is not a fit subject for legislative interference. But I should deem it perfectly legitimate that a person who has once been convicted of any act of violence to others under the influence of drink should be placed under special legal restriction, personal to himself, that if he were afterwards found drunk, he should be liable to a penalty, and that if, when in that state, he committed another offense, the punishment to which he would be liable for that other offense should be increased in severity. The making himself drunk in a person whom drunkenness excites to do harm to others is a crime against others. So, again, idleness except in a person receiving support from the public, or except when it constitutes a breach of contract, cannot, without tyranny, be made a subject of legal punishment. But if, either from idleness or from any other avoidable cause, man fails to perform his legal duties to others, as, for instance, to support his children, it is no tyranny to force him to fulfill that obligation by compulsory labor, if no other means are available. Again, there are many acts which, being directly injurious only to the agents themselves, ought not to be legally interdicted, but which, if done publicly, are a violation of good manners and, coming thus within the category of offenses against others, may rightly be prohibited. Of this kind are offenses against decency, on which it is unnecessary to dwell, the rather as they are only connected indirectly with our subject, the objection to publicity being equally strong in the case of many actions not in themselves condemnable, nor supposed to be so. There is another question to which an answer must be found, consistent with the principles which have been laid down. 
cases of personal conduct supposed to be blamable, but which respect for liberty precludes society from preventing or punishing, because the evil directly resulting falls wholly on the agent, what the agent is free to do, ought other persons to be equally free to counsel or instigate? This question is not free from difficulty. The case of a person who solicits another to do an act is not strictly a case of self-regarding conduct. To give advice or offer inducements to anyone is a social act, and may therefore, like actions in general which affect others, be supposed amenable to social control. But a little reflection corrects this first impression by showing that if the case is not strictly within the definition of individual liberty, yet the reasons on which the principle of individual liberty is grounded are applicable to it. If people must be allowed, in whatever concerns only themselves, to act as seems best to themselves, at their own peril, they must equally be free to consult with one another about what is fit to be done, to exchange opinions and give and receive suggestions. Whatever it is permitted to do, it must be permitted to advise to do. The question is doubtful only when the instigator derives a personal benefit from his advice. When he makes it his occupation, for subsistence or pecuniary gain, to promote what society and the state consider to be an evil. Then, indeed, a new element of complication is introduced, namely, the existence of classes of persons with an interest opposed to what is considered as the public wheel, and whose mode of living is grounded on the counteraction of it. Ought this to be interfered with, or not? Fornication, for example, must be tolerated, and so must gambling. But should a person be free to be a pimp, or to keep a gambling house? Case is one of those which lie in the exact boundary line between two principles, and it is not at once apparent to which of the two it properly belongs. There are arguments on both sides. On the side of toleration, it may be said that the fact of following anything is an occupation and living or profiting by the practice of it, cannot make that criminal which would otherwise be admissible. That the act should either be consistently permitted or consistently prohibited. That if the principles which we have hitherto defined are true, society has no business, as society, to decide anything to be wrong with what concerns only the individual. That it cannot go beyond dissuasion, and that one person should be as free to persuade as another to dissuade. In opposition to this, it may be contended that although the public or the state are not warranted in authoritatively deciding, for purposes of repression or punishment, that such or such, or such conduct affecting only the interest of the individual is good or bad, they are fully justified in assuming, if they regard it as bad, that its being so or not is at least a disputable question that, this being supposed, they cannot be acting wrongly in endeavoring to exclude the influence of solicitations which are not disinterested, of instigators who cannot possibly be impartial, who have a direct personal interest on one side, and that side the one which the state believes to be wrong, and who confessedly promote it for personal objects only. There can surely, it may be urged, be nothing lost, no sacrifice of good, by so ordering matters that persons shall make their election, either wisely or foolishly, on their own promoting, as free as possible from the arts of persons who stimulate their inclination for interested purposes of their own. Thus, it may be said, though the statutes respecting unlawful gains are utterly indefensible, though all persons should be free to gamble in their own or each other's houses, or in any place of meeting established by their own subscriptions and open only to the members and their visions, yet public gambling houses should not be permitted. It is true that the prohibition is never effectual, and that, whatever amount of tyrannical power may be given to the police, gambling houses can always be maintained under other pretenses. But they may be compelled to conduct their operations, with a certain degree of secrecy and mystery, so that nobody knows anything about them but those who seek them. 
and more than this society ought not to aim at. There is considerable force in these arguments. I will not venture to decide whether they are sufficient to justify the moral anomaly of punishing the accessory when the principal is, and must be, allowed to go free, of fining or imprisoning the procurer, but not the fornicator, the gambling housekeeper, but not the gambler. Still less ought the common operations of buying and selling to be interfered with on anomalous grounds. Almost every article which is bought and sold may be used in excess, and the sellers have a pecuniary interest in encouraging that excess. But no argument can be founded on this favor, for instance, of the main law, because the class of dealers in strong drinks, though interested in their abuse, are indispensably required for the sake of their legitimate use. The interest, however, of these dealers in promoting intemperance is a real evil, and justifies the state in imposing restrictions and requiring guarantees which, but for that justification, would be infringements of legitimate liberty. A further question is whether the state, while it permits, should nevertheless indirectly discourage conduct which it deems contrary to the best interest of the agent. Whether, for example, it should take measures to render the means of junkets more costly, or add to the difficulty of procuring them by limiting the number of places of sale. On this, as on most other practical questions, many distinctions require to be made. To tax stimulants for the sole purpose of making them more difficult to be obtained is a measure differing only in degree from their entire prohibition, and would be justifiable only if that were justifiable. Every increase of cost is a prohibition to those whose means do not come up to the augmented price, and to those who do, it is a penalty laid on them for gratifying a particular taste. Their choice of pleasures and their mode of expending their income, after satisfying their legal and moral obligations to the state and to individuals, are their own concern, and must rest with their own judgment. These considerations may serve at first sight to condemn the selection of stimulants as special subjects of taxation for purposes of revenue. But it must be remembered that taxation for fiscal purposes is absolutely inevitable that in most countries it is necessary that a considerable part of that taxation should be indirect, that the state, therefore, cannot help imposing penalties, which to some persons may be prohibitory, on the use of some articles of consumption. It is hence the duty of the state to consider, in the imposition of taxes, what commodities the consumers can best spare, and a fortiori to select in preferences those of which it deems the use beyond a very moderate quantity, to be positively injurious. Taxation, therefore, of stimulants up to the point which produces the largest amount of revenue, supposing that the state needs all the revenue which it yields, is not only admissible, but to be approved of. The question of making the sale of these commodities a more or less exclusive privilege must be answered differently according to the purposes to which the restriction is intended to be subservient. All places of public resort require the restraint of a police, and the places of this kind peculiarly because offenses against society are especially apt to originate there. It is, therefore, fit to confine the power of selling these commodities, at least for consumption on the spot, to persons of known or vouched for respectability of conduct to make such regulation respecting hours of opening and closing as may be requisite for public surveillance, and to withdraw the license if breaches of the peace repeatedly take place through the connivance or incapacity of the keeper of the house, or if it becomes a rendezvous for concocting and preparing offenses against the law. Any further restriction I do not conceive to be, in principle, justifiable. The limitation in number, for instance, of beer and spirit houses for the express purpose of rendering them more difficult of access and diminishing the occasions of temptation, not only exposes all to an inconvenience because there are some by whom the facility would be abused, but is suited only to a state of society 
in which the laboring classes are avowedly treated as children or savages, and placed under an education of restraint, to fit them for future admission to the privileges of freedom. This is not the principle on which the laboring classes are professedly governed in any free country. And no person who sets due value on freedom will give his adhesion to their being so governed, unless, after all efforts have been exhausted to educate them for freedom and govern them as free men, and it has been definitively proved that they can only be governed as children. The bare statement of the alternative shows the absurdity of supposing that such efforts have been made in any case which needs to be considered here. It is only because the institutions of this country are a mass of inconsistencies that things find admittance into our practice which belong to the system of despotic or what is called paternal government, while the general freedom of our institutions precludes the exercise of the amount of control necessary to render the restraint of any real efficacy as a moral education. It was pointed out in an early part of this essay that the liberty of the individual, in things wherein the individual is alone concerned, implies the corresponding liberty in any number of individuals to regulate by mutual agreement such things as regard them jointly, and regarding no persons but themselves. This question presents no difficulty so long as the will of all the persons implicated remains unaltered. But since that will may change, it is often necessary, even in things which they are alone concerned, that they should enter into engagements with one another. And when they do, it is fit, as a general rule, that those engagements should be kept. Yet, in the laws, probably, of every country, this general rule has some exceptions. Not only persons are not held to engagements which violate the rights of third parties, but it is sometimes considered a sufficient reason for releasing them from an engagement that it is injurious to themselves. In this, and most other civilized countries, for example, an engagement by which a person should sell himself or allow himself to be sold as a slave would be null and void, neither enforced by law nor by opinion. The ground for thus limiting his power of voluntary disposing of his own lot in life is apparent, and is very clearly seen in this extreme case. The reason for not interfering, unless for the sake of others, with a person's voluntary acts is consideration for his liberty. His voluntary choice is evidence that what he so chooses is desirable, or at least endurable, to him and his good is on the whole best provided for by allowing him to take his own means of pursuing it. But by selling himself for a slave, he abdicates his liberty. He forgoes any future use of it beyond that single act. He therefore defeats, in his own case, the very purpose which is the justification of allowing him to dispose of himself. He is no longer free but is thenceforth in a position which has no longer the presumption in its favor that would be afforded by his voluntarily remaining in it. The principle of freedom cannot require that he should be free not to be free. It is not freedom to be allowed to alienate his freedom. These reasons, the force of which is so conspicuous in this peculiar case, are evidently of far wider application yet a limit is everywhere set to them by the necessities of life, which continually require, not indeed that we should resign our freedom, but that we should consent to this and the other limitation of it. The principle, however, which demands uncontrolled freedom of action in all that concerns only the agents themselves, requires that those who have become bound to one another in things which concern no third party, should be able to release one another from the engagement. And even without such voluntary release, there are perhaps no contracts or engagements, except those that relate to money or money's worth, of which one can venture to say that there ought to be no liberty whatever of retraction. Baron Wilhelm von Humboldt, in the excellent essay from which I have already quoted, states it as his conviction that engagements which involve personal relations or services 
should never be legally binding beyond a limited duration of time, and that the most important of these engagements, marriage, having the peculiarity that its objects are frustrated unless the feelings of both the parties are in harmony with it, should require nothing more than declared will of either party to dissolve it. This subject is too important and too complicated to be discussed in the parentheses, and I touch on it only so far as is necessary for purposes of illustration. If the conciseness and generality of Baron Humboldt's dissertation had not obliged him, in this instance, to content himself with enunciating his conclusion without discussing the premises, he would doubtless have recognized that the question cannot be decided on grounds so simple as those to which he confines himself. When a person, either by express promise or by conduct, has encouraged another to rely upon his continuing to act in a certain way, to build expectations and calculations, and stake any part of his plan of life upon that supposition, a new series of moral obligation arises on his part towards that person, which may possibly be overruled, but cannot be ignored. And again, if the relation between two contracting parties has been followed by consequences to others, if it has placed third parties in any peculiar position or, as in the case of marriage, has even called third parties into existence, obligations arise on the part of both the contracting parties towards those third persons, the fulfillment of which, or even at all events the mode of fulfillment, must be greatly affected by the continuance or disruption of the relation between the original parties to the contract. It does not follow, nor can I admit, that these obligations extend to requiring the fulfillment of the contract at all costs to the happiness of the reluctant party. But they are a necessary element in the question, and, even if, as von Humboldt maintains, they ought to make no difference to the legal freedom of the parties to release themselves from the engagement, and I also hold that they ought not to make much difference. They necessarily make a great difference in the moral freedom. A person is bound to take all these circumstances into account before resolving on a step which may affect such important interests of others, and if he does not allow proper weight to those interests, he is morally responsible for the wrong. I have made these obvious remarks for the better illustration of the general principle of liberty, and not because they are at all needed on a particular question, which, on the contrary, is usually discussed as if the interest of children was everything, and that of grown persons nothing. I have already observed that, owing to the absence of any recognized general principles, liberty is often granted where it should be withheld as well as withheld where it should be granted. And one of the cases in which, in the modern European world, the sentiment of liberty is the strongest, is a case where, in my view, it is altogether misplaced. A person should be free to do as he likes in his own concerns, but he ought not to be free to do as he likes in acting for another, under the pretext that the affairs of the other are his own affairs. The state while it respects the liberty of each in what specifically regards himself, is bound to maintain a vigilant control over his exercise of any power which it allows him to possess over others. This obligation is almost entirely disregarded in the case of family relations, a case, in its direct influence on human happiness, more important than all others taken together. The almost despotic power of husbands over wives need not be enlarged upon here, because nothing more is needed for the complete removal of the evil than that the wives should have the same rights and should receive the protection of the law in the same manner as all other persons. And because, on this subject, the defenders of established injustice do not avail themselves of the plea of liberty, but stand forth openly as the champions of power. It is, in the case of children, that misapplied notions of liberty are a real obstacle to the fulfillment by the state of its duties. One would almost think that a man's children were supposed to be literally, and not metaphorically, a part of himself, 
so jealous is opinion of the smallest interference of the law with his absolute and exclusive control over them, more jealous than of almost any interference with his own freedom of action. So much less do the generality of mankind value liberty than power. Consider, for example, the case of education. Is it not almost a self-evident axiom that the state should require and compel the education up to a certain standard of every human being who was born its citizen? Yet who is there that is not afraid to recognize and assert this truth? Hardly anyone indeed will deny that it is one of the most sacred duties of the parents, or, as Lauren Usage now stand, the father, after summoning a human being into the world, to give to that being an education fitting him to perform his part well in life towards others and towards himself. But while this is unanimously declared to be the father's duty, scarcely anybody in this country will bear to hear of obliging him to perform it. Instead of his being required to make any exertion or sacrifice for securing education to his child, it is left to the choice to accept it or not when it is provided gratis. It still remains unrecognized that to bring a child into existence without a fair prospect of being able not only to provide food for its body, but instruction and training for its mind is a moral crime, both against the unfortunate offspring and against society. And that if the parent does not fulfill this obligation, the state ought to see it fulfilled at the charge, as far as possible, of the parent. Were the duty of enforcing universal education once admitted, there would be an end to the difficulties about what the state should teach, and how it should teach, which now convert the subject into a mere battlefield for sex and parties, causing the time and labor which should have been spent in educating to be wasted in quarreling about education. If the government would make up its mind to require for every child a good education, it might save itself the trouble of providing one. It might leave the parents to obtain education where and how they pleased, and content itself with helping to pay the school fees of the poorer classes of children and defraying the entire school expenses of those who have no one else to pay for them. The objections which are urged with reason against state education do not imply to the enforcement of education by the state, but to the state's taking upon itself to direct that education, which is a totally different thing. That the whole or any large part of the education of the people should be in the state's hands, I go as far as anyone in deprecating. All that has been said of the importance of individuality of character and diversity in opinions and mode of conduct involves, as of the same unspeakable importance, diversity of education. A general state education is a mere contrivance for molding people to be exactly like one another. And as the mold in which it casts them is that which pleases the predominant power in the government, whether this be a monarch, a priesthood, an aristocracy, or the majority of the existing generation. In proportion as it is efficient and successful, it establishes a despotism over the mind, leading by natural tendency to one over the body. An education established and controlled by the state should only exist, if it exists at all, as one among many competing experiments, carried on for the purpose of example and stimulus to keep the others up to a certain standard of excellence unless, indeed, when society in general is in so backward a state that it could not or would not provide for itself any proper institutions of education unless the government took the task, then, indeed, the government may, as the less of two great evils, take upon itself the business of schools and universities, as it may that of joint stock companies when private enterprise, in a shape fitted for undertaking great works of industry, does not exist in the country. But, in general, if the country contains a sufficient number of persons qualified to provide education under government auspices, the same persons would be able and willing to give an equally good education on the voluntary principle, under the assurance of remuneration afforded by a law rendering education compulsory, combined with state aid to those unable to defray the expense. The instrument for enforcing the law could be no other than public examinations extending to all children and beginning at an early age. 
an age might be fixed at which every child must be examined to ascertain if he or she is able to read. If a child proves unable, the father, unless he has some sufficient ground of excuse, might be subjected to a moderate fine, to be worked out, if necessary, by his labor, and the child might be put to school at his expense. Once in every year the examination should be renewed, with a gradually extending range of subjects, so as to make the universal acquisition, and what is more, retention, of a certain minimum of general knowledge virtually compulsory. Beyond that minimum, there should be voluntary examinations on all subjects, at which all who come up to a certain standard of proficiency might claim a certificate. To prevent the state from exercising, through these arrangements, an improper influence over opinion, the knowledge required for passing an examination, beyond the merely instrumental parts of knowledge, such as languages and their use, should, even in the higher classes of examinations, be confined to facts and positive science exclusively. The examination on religion, politics, or other disputed topics should not turn on the truth or falsehood of opinions, but on the matter of fact that such and such an opinion is held on such grounds by such authors or schools or churches. Under this system, the rising generation would be no worse off in regard to all disputed truths than they are at present. They would be brought up either churchmen or dissenters as they now are, the state merely taking care that they should be instructed churchmen or instructed dissenters. There would be nothing to hinder them from being taught religion if their parents chose at the same schools where they were taught other things. All attempts by the state to bias the conclusions of its citizens on disputed subjects are evil, but it may very properly offer to ascertain and certify that a person possesses the knowledge requisite to make his conclusions on any given subject worth attending to. A student of philosophy would be the better for being able to stand an examination both in Locke and in Kant, whichever of the two he takes up with, or even if with neither. And there is no reasonable objection to examining an atheist in the evidences of Christianity, provided he is not required to profess a belief in them. The examinations, however, in the higher branches of knowledge should, I conceive, be entirely voluntary. It would be giving too dangerous a power to governments were they allowed to exclude anyone from professions, even from the profession of teacher, for alleged deficiency of qualifications. And I think, with Wilhelm von Humboldt, that degrees or other public certificates of scientific or professional acquirements should be given to all who present themselves for examination and stand the test, but that such certificates should confer no advantage over competitors other than the weight which may be attached to their testimony by public opinion. It is not in the matter of education only that misplaced notions of liberty prevent moral obligations on the part of parents from being recognized, and legal obligations from being imposed, where there are the strongest grounds for the former always, and in many cases for the latter also. The fact itself of causing the existence of a human being is one of the most responsible actions in the range of human life. To undertake this responsibility, to bestow a life which may be either a curse or a blessing, unless the being on whom it is to be bestowed will have at least the ordinary chances of a desirable existence, is a crime against that being. And in a country, either overpeopled or threatened with being so, to produce children beyond a very small number, with the effect of reducing the reward of labor by their competition, is a serious offense against all who live by the remuneration of their labor. The laws which, in many countries on the continent, forbid marriage unless the parties can show that they have the means of supporting a family, do not exceed the legitimate powers of the state. And whether such laws be expedient or not, a question mainly dependent on local circumstances and feelings, they are not objectionable as violations of liberty. Such laws are interferences of the state to prohibit a mischievous act, an act injurious to others, which ought to be a subject of reprobation and social stigma, even when it is not deemed expedient to superadd legal punishment. 
Yet the current ideas of liberty, which bend so easily to real infringements of the freedom of the individual in things which concern only himself, would repel the attempt to put any restraint upon his inclinations when the consequence of their indulgence is a life or lives of wretchedness and depravity to the offspring, with manifold evils to those sufficiently within reach to be in any way affected by their actions. When we compare the strange respect of mankind for liberty with their strange want of respect for it, we might imagine that a man had an indispensable right to do harm to others, and no right at all to please himself without giving pain to anyone. I have reserved for the last place a large class of questions respecting the limits of government interference, which, though closely connected with the subject of this essay, do not in strictness belong to it. These are cases in which the reasons against interference do not turn upon the principle of liberty. The question is not about restraining the actions of individuals, but about helping them. It is asked whether the government should do, or cause to be done, something for their benefit instead of leaving it to be done by themselves, individually or in voluntary combination. The objections to government interference, when it is not such as to involve infringement of liberty, may be of three kinds. The first is when the thing to be done is likely to be better done by individuals than by the government. Speaking generally, there is no one so fit to conduct any business, or to determine how or by whom it shall be conducted, as those who are personally interested in it. This principle condemns the interferences, one so common, of the legislature, or the officers of government, with the ordinary processes of industry. But this part of the subject has been sufficiently enlarged upon by political economists, and is not particularly related to the principles of this essay. The second objection is more nearly allied to our subject. In many cases, though individuals may not do the particular thing so well, on the average as the offices of government, it is nevertheless desirable that it should be done by them, rather than by the government, as a means to their own mental education, a mode of strengthening their active facilities, exercising their judgment, and giving them a familiar knowledge of the subjects with which they are thus left to deal. This is a principle, though not the sole, recommendation of jury trial, in cases not political, of free and popular local and municipal institutions, of the conduct of industrial and philanthropic enterprises by voluntary associations. These are not questions of liberty, and are connected with that subject only by remote tendencies, but they are questions of development. It belongs to a different occasion from the present to dwell on these things as parts of national education, as being, in truth, the particular training of a citizen, the practical part of the political education of a free people, taking them out of the narrow circle of personal and family selfishness, and accustoming them to the comprehension of joint interests, the management of joint concerns, habituating them to act from public or semi-public motives, and guide their conduct by aims which unite, instead of isolating them from one another. Without these habits and powers, a free constitution can neither be worked nor preserved, as is exemplified by the too often transitory nature of political freedom in countries where it does not rest upon a sufficient basis of local liberties. The management of purely local business by the localities and of the great enterprises of industry by the union of those who voluntarily supply the pecuniary means, is further recommended by all the advantages which have been set forth in this essay as belonging to individuality of development and diversity of modes of action. Government operations tend to be everywhere alike. With individuals and voluntary associations, on the contrary, there are varied experiments and endless diversity of experience. What the state can usefully do is make itself a central depository, an active circulator and diffuser of the experience resulting from many trials. Its business is to enable each experimentalist to benefit by the experiments of others, instead of tolerating no experiments but its own. The third and most cogent reason for restricting the interference of government is the great evil of adding unnecessarily to its power. 
Every function superadded to those already exercised by the government causes its influence over hopes and fears to be more widely diffused, and converts more and more the active and ambitious part of the public into hangers-on of the government, or of some party which aims at becoming the government. If the roads, the railways, the banks, the insurance offices, the great joint stock companies, the university, and the public charities were all of them branches of the government, if, in addition, the municipal corporations and local boards, with all that now devolves on them, became departments of the central administration, if the employees of all these different enterprises were appointed and paid by the government, and looked to the government for every rise in life, not all the freedom of the press and popular constitution of the legislature would make this or any other country free otherwise than in name. And the evil would be greater the more efficiently and scientifically the administrative machinery was constructed, the more skillful the arrangements for obtaining the best qualified hands and heads with which to work it. In England, it has of late been proposed that all the members of the civil service of government should be selected by competitive examination to obtain for those employments the most intelligent and instructive persons procurable, and much has been said and written for and against this proposal. One of the arguments most insisted on by its opponents is that the occupation of a permanent official servant of the state does not hold out sufficient prospects of emolument and importance to attract the highest talents which will always be able to find a more inviting career in the professions or in the service of companies and other public bodies. One would not have been surprised if this argument had been used by the friends of the proposition as an answer to its principal difficulty. Coming from the opponents, it is strange enough. What is urged as an objection is the safety valve of the proposed system. If, indeed, all the high talent of the country could be drawn into the service of government, a proposal tending to bring about that result might well inspire uneasiness. If every part of the business of society, which required organized concert, or large and comprehensive views, were in the hands of government, and if government offices were universally filled by the ablest men, all the enlarged culture and practiced intelligence in the country, except the purely speculative, would be concentrated in a numerous bureaucracy, to whom alone the rest of the community would look for all things. The multitude for direction and dictation in all they had to do, the able and aspiring for personal advancement. To be admitted into the ranks of this bureaucracy, and when admitted to rise therein, would be the sole objects of ambition. Under this regime, not only is the outside public ill-qualified for want of practical experience to criticize or check the mode of operation of the bureaucracy, but even if the accidents of despotic or the natural working of popular institutions occasionally raise to the summit a ruler or rulers of reforming inclinations, no reform can be effected which is contrary to the interest of the bureaucracy. Such is the melancholy condition of the Russian Empire, as shown in the accounts of those who have had sufficient opportunity of observation. The Tsar himself is powerless against the bureaucratic body. He can send any one of them to Siberia, but he cannot govern without them, or against their will. On every decree of his they have a tacit veto, by merely refraining from carrying it into effect. In countries of more advanced civilization, and of a more insurrectionary spirit, the public, accustomed to expect everything to be done for them by the state, or at least to do nothing for themselves without asking from the state not only leave to do it, but even how it is to be done, naturally hold the state responsible for all evil which befalls them, and when the evil exceeds their amount of patience, they rise up against the government and make what is called a revolution, whereupon somebody else, with or without legitimate authority from the nation, vaults into the seat, issues his orders to bureaucracy, and everything goes on much as it did before the bureaucracy being unchanged, and nobody else being capable of taking their place. A very different spectacle is exhibited among a people accustomed to transact their own business. In France, a large part of the people, having been engaged in military service, 
many of whom have had at least the rank of non-commissioned officers, there are in every popular insurrection several persons competent to take the lead and improvise some tolerable plan of action. What the French are in military affairs, the Americans are in every kind of civil business. Let them be left without a government, every body of Americans is able to improvise one, and to carry on that or any other public business with a sufficient amount of intelligence, order, and decision. This is what every free people ought to be, and a people capable of this is certain to be free. It will never let itself be enslaved by any man or body of men, because these are able to seize and pull the reins of the central administration. No bureaucracy can hope to make such a people as this do or undergo anything that they do not like. But, where everything is done through the bureaucracy, nothing to which the bureaucracy is really adverse can be done at all. The constitution of such countries is an organization of the experience and practical ability of the nation into a disciplined body for the purpose of governing the rest. And the more perfect that organization is in itself, the more successful in drawing to itself and educating for itself the persons of greatest capacity from all ranks of the community, the more complete is the bondage of all, the members of the bureaucracy included. For the governors are as much the slaves of their organization and discipline as the governed are of the governors. A Chinese Mandarin, footnote, the cultivated and genteel officers or bureaucrats who administer the Chinese empire, is as much the tool and creature of a despotism as the humblest cultivator. An individual Jesuit is to the utmost degree of abasement the slave of his order, though the order itself exists for the collective power and importance of its members. It is not also to be forgotten that the absorption of all the principal ability of the country into the governing body is fatal, sooner or later, to the mental activity and progressiveness of the body itself. Banded together as they are, working a system which, like all systems, necessarily proceeds in great measure by fixed rules, the official body are under the constant temptation of sinking into indolent routine, or, if they now and then desert that mill-house round, of rushing into some half-examined crudity which has struck the fancy of some leading member of the corps, And the sole check to these closely allied, though seemingly opposite tendencies, the only stimulus which can keep the ability of the body itself up to a high standard, is liability to the watchful criticism of equal ability outside the body. It is indispensable, therefore, that the means should exist, independently of the government, of forming such ability and furnishing it with the opportunities and experience necessary for her correct judgment of great practical affairs. If we would possess permanently a skillful and efficient body of functionaries, above all a body able to originate and willing to adopt improvements, if we would not have our bureaucracy degenerate into a pedantocracy, this body must not engross all the occupations which form and cultivate the faculties required for the government of mankind. To determine the point at which evils, so formidable to human freedom and advancement, begin, or rather at which they begin to predominate over the benefits attending the collective application of the force of society, under its recognized chiefs, for the removal of the obstacles which stand in the way of its well-being, to secure as much of the advantages of centralized power and intelligence as can be had without turning into government channels too great a proportion of its general activity, is one of the most difficult and complicated questions in the art of government. It is, in great measure, a question of detail in which many and various considerations must be kept in view, and no absolute rule can be laid down. But I believe that the practical principle in which safety resides, the ideal to be kept in view, the standard by which to test all arrangements intended for overcoming the difficulty, may be conveyed in these words. The greatest dissemination of power consistent with efficiency, but the greatest possible centralization of information and diffusion of it from the center. Thus, in municipal administration, there would be, as in the New England states, a very minute division among separate officers, chosen by the localities, of all business which is not better left to the persons directly interested. 
But besides this, there would be, in each department of local affairs, a central superintendence, forming a branch of the general government. The organ of the superintendence would concentrate, as in a focus, the variety of information and experience derived from the conduct of that branch of public business in all the localities, from everything analogous which is done in foreign countries, and from the general principles of political science. This central organ should have a right to know all that is done, and its special duty should be that of making the knowledge acquired in one place available for others. Emancipated from the petty prejudices and narrow views of a locality by its elevated position and comprehensive sphere of observation, its advice would naturally carry much authority. But its actual power as a permanent institution should, I conceive, be limited to compelling the local officers to obey the laws laid down for their guidance. In all things not provided for by general rules, those officers should be left to their own judgment under responsibility to their constituents. For their violation of rules, they should be responsible to law, and the rules themselves should be laid down by the legislature, the central administrative authority only watching over their execution and, if they were not properly carried into effect, appealing, according to the nature of the case, to the tribunals to enforce the law, or to the constituencies to dismiss the functionaries who had not executed it according to its spirits. Such, in its general conception, is the central superintendence which the Poor Law Board is intended to exercise over the administrators of the poor rate throughout the country. Whatever powers the Board exercises beyond this limit were right and necessary in that peculiar case for the cure of rooted habits of maladministration in matters deeply affecting not the localities merely, but the whole community since no locality has a moral right to make itself by mismanagement a nest of pauperism, necessarily overflowing into other localities and impairing the moral and physical condition of the whole laboring community. The powers of administrative coercion and subordinate legislation possessed by the Poor Law Board, but which, owing to the state of opinion on the subject, are very scantily exercised by them, though perfectly justifiable in the case of first-rate national interest, would be wholly out of place in the superintendence of interest purely local. But a central organ of information and instruction for all the localities would be equally valuable in all departments of administration. A government cannot have too much of the kind of activity which does not impede, but aids and stimulates individual exertion and development. The mischief begins when, instead of calling forth the activities and powers of individual and bodies, it substitutes its own activity for theirs, when, instead of informing, advising, and upon occasion denouncing, it makes them work in fetters, or bids them stand aside and does their work instead of them. The worth of a state, in the long run, is the worth of the individuals composing it, and a state which postpones the interest of their mental expansion an elevation to a little more of the administrative skill, or of that semblance of it which practice gives in the details of business, a state which dwarfs its men in order that they may be more docile instruments in its hands even for beneficial purposes, will find that with small men no great thing can really be accomplished, and that the perfection of machinery to which it has sacrificed everything will in the end avail it nothing for want of the vital power which, in order that the machine might work more smoothly, it has preferred to banish. End of On Liberty by John Stuart Mill, Chapter 5, Applications End of On Liberty by John Stuart Mill, 